The military history of Italy chronicles a vast time period, lasting from the overthrow of Tarquinius Superbus in 509 BC, through the Roman Empire, Italian unification, and into the modern day. The Italian peninsula has been a center of military conflict throughout European history. Ancient Italy in the 8th century BC, a group of Italic tribes shared the Italian peninsula with two other major ethnic groups, the Etruscans in the north, and the Greeks in the south. The Etruscans were settled north of Rome in Etruria. They founded cities like Tarquinia, Veri and Volterra and deeply influenced Roman culture, as clearly shown by the Etruscan origin of some of the mythical Roman kings. The origins of the Etruscans are lost in prehistory. Historians have no literature, no texts of religion or philosophy. Therefore much of what is known about this civilization is derived from grave goods and tomb findings. The Italics were warlike as the Etruscans. The Italics and the Etruscans had a significant military tradition. In addition to marking the rank and power of certain individuals in their culture, warfare was a considerable economic boon to their civilization. Like many ancient societies, the Italics and the Etruscans conducted campaigns during summer months, raiding neighboring areas attempting to gain territory and combating piracy, banditism as a means of acquiring valuable resources such as land, prestige and goods. It is also likely individuals taken in battle would be ransomed back to their families and clans at high cost. The Greeks had founded many colonies in southern Italy, such as Cumae, Naples and Taranto, as well as in the eastern two-thirds of Sicily. Between 750 and 550 BC, after 650 BC, the Etruscans became dominant in central Italy, and expanded into north Italy founding cities like Mutina and Felsina. Roman tradition claimed that Rome had been under the control of seven Etruscan kings from 753 to 509 BC beginning with the mythic Romulus who along with his brother Remus were said to have founded the city of Rome. Rome. The early Roman army was, like those of other contemporary city-states influenced by Greek civilization, a citizen militia which practiced hoplite tactics. It was small and organized in five classes, with three providing hoplites and two providing light infantry. The early Roman army was tactically limited and its stance during this period was essentially defensive. By the 3rd century BC, the Romans abandoned the hoplite formation in favor of a more flexible system in which smaller groups of 120 men called maniples could maneuver more independently on the battlefield. Thirty maniples arranged in three lines with supporting troops constituted a legion, totaling between 4,000 and 5,000 men. The early Republican legion consisted of five sections, each of which was equipped differently and had different places in formation. The three lines of manipular heavy infantry, a force of light infantry, and the cavalry. With the new organization came a new orientation toward the offensive and a much more aggressive posture toward adjoining city-states. At nominal full strength, an early Republican legion would have included 3,600 to 4,800 heavy infantry, several hundred light infantry and several hundred cavalrymen, for a total of 4,000 to 5,000 men. Legions were often significantly under strength from recruitment failures or following periods of active service due to accidents, battle casualties, disease and desertion. During the Civil War, Pompey's legions in the East were at full strength because recently recruited, while Caesar's legions were in many cases well below nominal strength after long active service in Gaul. This pattern also held true for auxiliary forces. Until the late Republican period, the typical legionary was a property-owning citizen farmer from a rural area who served for particular campaigns, and who supplied his own equipment and, in the case of equites, his own mount. Harris suggests that down to 200 BC, the average rural farmer might participate in six or seven campaigns. Freedmen and slaves and urban citizens did not serve except in rare emergencies. 
After 200 BC, economic conditions in rural areas deteriorated as manpower needs increased, so that the property qualifications for service were gradually reduced. Beginning with Gaius Marius in 107 BC, citizens without property and some urban dwelling citizens were enlisted and provided with equipment, although most legionaries continued to come from rural areas. Terms of service became continuous and long, up to 20 years if emergencies required it although Brunt argues that six or seven years was more typical. Beginning in the 3rd century BC, legionaries were paid stipendium, could anticipate booty and donatives from successful campaigns and, beginning at the time of Marius, often were granted allotments of land upon retirement. Cavalry and light infantry attached to a legion were often recruited in the areas where the legion served. Caesar formed a legion, the Fifth Alordi, from non-citizens in Transalpine Gaul to serve in his campaigns in Gaul. By the time of Caesar Augustus, the ideal of the citizen-soldier had been abandoned and the legions had become fully professional. Legionaries were paid 900 cestuses a year and could expect a payment of 12,000 cestuses on retirement. At the end of the Civil War, Augustus reorganized Roman military forces, discharging soldiers and disbanding legions. He retained 28 legions, distributed through the provinces of the empire. During the Principate, the tactical organization of the army continued to evolve. The auxilla remained independent cohorts, and legionary troops often operated as groups of cohorts rather than as full legions. A new versatile type of unit, the cohortes equitator, combining cavalry and legionaries in a single formation could be stationed at garrisons or outposts, could fight on their own as balanced small forces or could combine with other similar units as a larger legion-sized force. This increase in organizational flexibility over time helped ensure the long-term success of Roman military forces. The Emperor Gallienus began a reorganization that created the final military structure of the late empire, withdrawing some legionaries from the fixed bases on the border. Gallienus created mobile forces and stationed them behind and at some distance from the borders as a strategic reserve. The border troops stationed at fixed bases continued to be the first line of defense. The basic unit of the field army was the regiment, legionus or auxilla for infantry and vexillationus for cavalry. Evidence suggests that nominal strengths may have been 1,200 men for infantry regiments and 600 for cavalry, although many records show lower actual troop levels. Many infantry and cavalry regiments operated in pairs under the command of a cums. In addition to Roman troops, the field armies included regiments of barbarians recruited from allied tribes and known as Foderati. By 400 AD, Foderati regiments had become permanently established units of the Roman army, paid and equipped by the empire, led by a Roman tribune and used just as Roman units were used. In addition to the Foderati, the empire also used groups of barbarians to fight along with the legions as allies, without integration into the field armies. Under the command of the senior Roman general present, they were led at lower levels by their own officers. Military leadership evolved greatly over the course of the history of Rome. Under the monarchy, the hoplite armies would have been led by the kings of Rome. During the early and middle Roman Republic, military forces were under the command of one of the two elected consuls for the year. During the later Republic, members of the Roman senatorial elite, as part of the normal sequence of elected public officers known as the cursus honorum, would have served first as quaestor, then as praetor. Following the end of a term as praetor or consul, a senator might be appointed by the Senate as a pro-praetor or proconsul to govern a foreign province. More junior officers were selected by their commanders from their own clientele or those recommended by political allies among the senatorial elite. 
under Augustus, whose most important political priority was to place the military under a permanent and unitary command. The emperor was the legal commander of each legion but exercised that command through a legatus he appointed from the senatorial elite. In a province with a single legion, the legate would command the legion and also serve as provincial governor. While in a province with more than one legion, each legion would be commanded by a legate and the legates would be commanded by the provincial governor. During the later stages of the imperial period, the Augustan model was abandoned. Provincial governors were stripped of military authority and command of the armies in a group of provinces was given to generals appointed by the emperor. These were no longer members of the Roman elite but men who came up through the ranks and had seen much practical soldiering. With increasing frequency, these men attempted to usurp the positions of the emperors who had appointed them. Decreased resources, increasing political chaos and civil war eventually left the Western Empire vulnerable to attack and take over by neighboring barbarian peoples. Comparatively less is known about the Roman navy than the Roman army. Prior to the middle of the 3rd century BC, officials known as Duumviri Navales commanded a fleet of 20 ships used mainly to control piracy. This fleet was given up in 278 AD and replaced by Allied forces. The First Punic War required that Rome build large fleets, and it did so largely with the assistance of unfinancing from Allies. This reliance on Allies continued to the end of the Roman Republic. The Quincomi was the main warship on both sides of the Punic Wars and remained the mainstay of Roman naval forces until replaced by the time of Caesar Augustus by lighter and more maneuverable vessels. As compared with Etrarim, the Quincomi permitted the use of a mix of experienced and inexperienced crewmen, and its lesser maneuverability permitted the Romans to adopt imperfect boarding tactics using a troop of approximately 40 marines in lieu of the ram. Ships were commanded by a novarch, a rank equivalent to a centurion, who were usually not citizens. Potter suggests that because the fleet was dominated by non-Romans, the navy was considered non-Roman and allowed to atrophy in times of peace. Available information suggests that by the time of the late empire, the Roman navy comprised a number of fleets including both warships and merchant vessels for transportation and supply. Warships were oared sailing galleys with three to five banks of oarsmen. Fleet bases included such ports as Ravenna, Arles, Aquilae, Misenum and the mouth of the Somme River in the western Alexandria and Rhodes in the east. Flotillas of small river craft were part of the Limitanea during this period, based at fortified river harbours along the Rhine and the Danube. The fact that prominent generals commanded both armies and fleets suggests that naval forces were treated as auxiliaries to the army and not as an independent service. The details of command structure and fleet strengths during this period are not well known although it is known that fleets were commanded by prefects, Middle Ages. Throughout the Middle Ages, from the collapse of a central Roman government in the late 5th century to the Italian Wars of the Renaissance, Italy was constantly divided between opposing factions fighting for control. At the time of the deposition of Romulus Augustulus, the Herali Confederation governed Italy, but it was displaced by the Ostrogoths, who fought a long war with the Byzantine army in Italy. The Byzantine came out of the war victorious only to find Italy invaded by a new wave of barbarians led by the Lombards. The Lombards diminished Byzantine territory to the Exarchate of Ravenna, the Duchy of Rome, the Duchy of Naples, and the far south of Apulia and Calabria. They established a kingdom centered on Pavia in the north. During the interregnum called the Rule of the Dukes, the Dukes of the Lombards invaded Burgundy, but were repulsed by the Merovingian King Guntram, who in turn invaded Italy and took the region of Savoy. The Lombards were forced to elect a new king to organize their defense. 
For the next two centuries, the Byzantine power in the peninsula was reduced by the Lombard kings, the greatest of which was Leoprand, until it consisted of little more than the tips of the Italian toe and heel, Romanitz environs being practically independent under the popes and the Neapolitan coast under or its dukes. In 774, Charlemagne of the Franks invaded and conquered the Lombard kingdom. In the south of the peninsula, the Duchy of Benevento remained independent of Frankish dominion. However, during the period of Carolingian strength, Charlemagne's descendants governed the north of Italy in relative peace except for the brief period of the rebellion of Bernard and the constant raids from the Slavs to the east and the Saracens to the south. Pirates harassed the Adriatic and Ligurian coasts and the islands of Corsica and Sardinia. The south was very different, as the Lombards were at the height of their power there. Warfare between Lombard and Greek, especially the Greek city-states of the Tyrrhenian, was endemic. The Greek cities fell out of the orbit of Constantinople and Byzantine possessions shrank to their smallest markers the Lombards and the Saracens, increased their predations. In 831, the Arabs conquered Palermo and in 902 they conquered Taumina, ending the conquest of Sicily. They likewise established their presence on the peninsula, especially on the Garigliano and in Bari. The story of the incessant conflicts of the states of the Mezzogiorno is chaotic until the arrival of the Normans in the early 11th century. Under their leadership, the Jews of the south found themselves eventually united, the Arabs expelled, and the whole Mezzogiorno subjugated to the Hortville dynasty of kings of Sicily. The second half of the Middle Ages in Italy was marked by frequent conflict between the Holy Roman Empire and the Papacy the latter eventually emerging victorious in that it ultimately prevented political unification of northern Italy under imperial rule. Imperial invasions were led by more or less all medieval emperors, the most notable episodes being the end of the investiture controversy by the pilgrimage of Henry IV, Holy Roman Emperor at Canossa in 1077 and the no less than five major invasions staged by Frederick Barbarossa against the Lombard League, culminating in the sack of Milan in 1162, after which every building in the city was demolished, except the churches. The lasting conflict led to the emergence of the Guelph and the Ghibelline parties in northern Italy, supporting respectively the Pope and the Emperor, though siding with the party was often dictated by other political considerations. In May 1176, the Lombard League, led by a revived Milan, defeated the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa at Legnano. The victory of the Guelph party meant the end of imperial overlordship over northern Italy, and the formation of city-states such as Florence. Venice, Milan, Genoa or Siena. While Venice was turning to the seas, supporting, and acquiring large loot from, the 1204 Fourth Crusade sack of Constantinople, the other city-states were struggling for control of mainland, Florence being the rising power of the time. Sicily was invaded in 1266 by Charles I, Duke of Anjou. The Angevines were however toppled in the 1282 Sicilian Vespers, and Peter III of Aragon invaded the island. This set the background for later French claims over Naples and Sicily. Disintegration of the Holy Roman Empire and the Hundred Years' War in neighboring France meant that Italy was more or less left in peace during the 15th century. This allowed its cities to grow rich and to become attractive praise for its neighbors during the 16th century.